section one of the rover volume one number eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the rover volume one number eight edited by seba smith and lawrence labrie section one the mother's warning by lawrence labrie o oh, memory mine how often from the shadowy past dost thou bring up visions of youth and beauty with the magician's wand conjuring up from the dark charnel house of time forms of loveliness and grandeur till my heart throbs anew with old attachments and associations which float before the eye of my imagination like ghosts in the drapery moonlight how materially does time soften and mellow the events of the past harsher features seeming more mild fainter lines becoming more strongly marked as the heart receives and embalms all impressions of the beautiful and the intellectual alas we have learned to exclaim the days of chivalry are past tis an everyday world we live in now no romance no poetry of life knighthood and military dignity by this ipsa dixit sort of sentence are banished from this trading world this speculating world but the poetry of life ah there is more of it than there are hearts to feel it minds to sympathize with it gertrude my sweet child give me your hand while i ask you a simple question and i wish you to look me in the face as you answer me poor gertrude she approached the table at which her mother sat and extended her hand the other resting upon her snowy bosom tell me my daughter if that which i expect is true that you love maurice denning has he made any avowal of attachment to you a crimson flush overspread the fair features of gertrude as her eyes sought the floor and her silence betrayed how much she dreaded to attempt an answer why this silence my child have you any partiality to maurice above all others mother said the blushing girl but she could speak no more the crimson deepened her hands trembled and her eyes were moistened with tears ah said her mother i see it is so i am sorry very sorry gertrude you would oblige me my dear child if you would think no more of him i think it not a happy choice and it were better put an end to it once before your heart has too far committed its feelings take the age and experience of those older than yourself for it that he is no worthy match for you no answer poor gertrude had naught to say no denial to make no excuse to frame her pale and anxious mother looked fondly in her face and saw how true her doubts how well founded her fears the lover's letter lay on the table before them the mother's hand rested upon it who could withstand the pleading expression of that fond parent's face as she addressed her only child gertrude dared not raise her eyes to meet that gaze her shelter was in silence even so gertrude what i feared is true there is more confession in your looks than you could make with words i am sorry that i did not sooner speak of it that you kept it a secret from me my child that was wrong i could have advised you i could have cautioned you you gertrude are my only tie upon earth you have been my joy and comfort for seventeen years and oh how brief their existence how swift their flight i do not expect to hide you from the world to guard you with a miserly affection but still i may presume to advise you to watch you to fear for you to set your steps aright when i find you astray and to pray for you to that great fount of life and love which holdeth the destinies of the human family 
oh if you knew with what an anxious heart i have watched you from your cradle up your budding and your blossoming you would be careful to avoid aught that would cause me a moment's pain your unhappiness would be misery to me therefore gertrude wilton think well on it to-day sleep calmly on it to-night and arise in the morning determined to receive no more visits no more letters from maurice denning he is unworthy of you they parted gertrude retired to her own room and wept she thought of maurice who loved her maurice whom she loved he appeared always noble and kind why should she relinquish him her mother must be prejudiced had probably been misinformed by persons who were enemies of his then again the melancholy pleading of her mother's voice the persuasive and tender eloquence of her words went deep to the poor girl's heart and to please that mother whose only joy she was whom she so tenderly loved she resolved to relinquish maurice altogether to see him no more to receive from him no more letters weak heart there sometimes seems a destiny which no human efforts can avoid a maelstrom of circumstances which no power can steer clear of like insects that flutter around the blaze that destroys them do we often group around and follow the ignis fatuous that leads us to destruction that evening gertrude was on a visit to a friend maurice came in as usual he was agreeable and lively the time passed away pleasantly and when gertrude was ready to start for home maurice as a matter of course prepared to accompany her she could not refuse besides her mother must be prejudiced what could there be wrong in so nice a man they left the house together in the bright moonlight and the air was balmy with the odour of flowers and the fragrance of apple blossoms and the fireflies sported around them with their glittering wings it was a sweet spring evening and the very elements around them seemed harmonious with love what harm was it if they did not go immediately home it is the last time i shall see him thought gertrude and i cannot tell him all in so short a time besides to be abrupt would be so unkind so they walked back and forth in the bright moonlight and on the green grass maurice all the time pouring fond assurances of love into the willing ear of sweet gertrude and she more and more pleased and wondering more and more how her mother could possibly dislike him and thinking all the while that he never seemed half so kind nor half so dear to her as then and ere she had three times passed the shadow of her own dwelling she had made her mind up not to cast him off but to cling to him in spite of all circumstances notwithstanding the prejudices ungenerous she doubted not which existed against him oh how the rosy moments flew time's wings were not clipped he caught the breath of the lover's vows as he swept along and they were written in the story registry of heaven the mother's warning was forgotten and the moon had waned as gertrude on the threshold of her dwelling gave the parting kiss to her lover how with a chiding heart did the daughter seek the chamber of her mother at that moment the clock struck she counted the hour twelve impossible where had she been so late where had the hours flown what fascination had covered her that time had stolen so much the march of her her heart answered maurice ah gertrude gertrude it is the first time that ever you felt ashamed to enter into the presence of your mother what a humiliating feeling and so good so kind a mother too and who with patience and with prayer is awaiting her daughter's return tremblingly did gertrude put her finger upon the latch of the door for she felt like a guilty being she entered the room and her mother arose gertrude said she i'm so glad you have returned why did you stay so late i got frightened at your absence it is now midnight and the hours have been so very long and i was so fearful that you was unwell and so tired with waiting for you do not stay so long another time my dear child they retired to rest but gertrude could not sleep her mind was filled with thoughts of maurice and of her mother so patiently had mrs wilton watched for her coming through the long tedious hours of the night hours that to her had flown so swiftly by so fondly did she chide her on her return touching her heart more sensibly than sharp rebuke no slumber touched her eyelids that night for her torturing heart beat wildly in her bosom 
no happy dreams in rapture senses and elysian bliss it was all painful reality lingering enduring misery but how could she avoid her destiny how could she escape from that strong current of fate which seemed hurrying her onward poor gertrude the morning sun found her without sleep restless and impatient after the above night several days passed without a meeting between gertrude and maurice mrs wilton had avoided saying anything to her daughter that might in any way aggrieve her for believing her to be a girl of sense she left her to draw her own conclusions and deductions knowing as she did what were the sentiments of that only parent respecting her intimacy with maurice denning nor for a whole week did she mention his name indeed gertrude herself sometimes as she looked upon the pale countenance of her mother almost formed the resolution never to see him again but her reason was too weak the affections and sympathies of her heart overbalanced and all bright resolutions kicked the beam they met their hearts commingled her mother was forgotten and their vows of lasting affection were exchanged she could not believe that maurice was not the best the most kind and amiable man on earth what possible fault could her mother see in him still she kept her meetings private she had not the courage to acknowledge her intimacy with him advice she had already disregarded thus affairs progressed and day by day with each succeeding interview did her attachment strengthen and she soon felt as if she could sacrifice everything all persons for maurice among the multitude maurice denning would pass for a very clever a very agreeable young man his appearance was in his favour tall graceful and good-looking his manners were winning his voice was persuasive and at times tender he really had no very bad trait in his disposition he would not sit down with an intention of doing a wrong thing but temptation was luresome maurice was impulsive and he became a particularly improper companion for a weak-minded young woman a few weeks more and a secret marriage was performed the advice so kind so mild of a mother was forgotten she had wandered into the dark the morn of experience would show whether she had ventured upon misery or happiness but a secret could not rest long a mother's watchful eye the curious tongue of speculation soon brought to light the marriage of gertrude with denning there was no chiding it was now too late but the matron's brow was clouded with sorrow her heart beat heavy with dread her eyes grew dim and weary with weeping and watching but she did not murmur she feared her daughter would be full soon acquainted with woe and she forbore to add one pang to her tender heart she could not part with her at any rate so matters were arranged and they all resided together for the first month of course everything went well and pleasantly he seemed kind and attentive she appeared smiling and happy the next and the next month passed away and maurice lived spoke and acted as other men did when business did not control his time it was spent in the society of his wife and her mother and even mrs wilton began to think she had been hasty in forming an opinion in the ordinary circumstances of a married life there is nothing novel or very interesting affection at any rate is a matter of course while well, it was an object to be sought for when the contest was to win then indeed particularly when doubtful there is a charm of romance thrown around the pursuit and man's natural inclination for acquiring whips him to perseverance but the prize secured the goal won other objects for pursuit appear ambition becomes wedded and nothing but the wonderful lamp of aladdin could turn to light all that the craving and thirsty soul of man requires but why speculate upon the philosophy of the human soul its destiny is uncontrollable and absolute and the mysterious influences that govern it are subject to no positive laws other than certain nerve vitalic principles which lie beyond the perfect grasp of mortal intellect six months flew by and the novelty of marriage had ceased with maurice denning he was less at home less attentive less kind he began to find companions more congenial to his feelings than was the company of his sweet wife and her pious mother sometimes he even answered their questions with harshness that caused gertrude to weep and a sad foreboding to possess the heart of mrs wilton thus affairs went on for some time until at last the irregularities of maurice began to encroach upon the evenings that had hitherto been spent at home for some time longer and it was not an unfrequent sight to see him wandering home in the grey of the morning 
his eyes red himself nervous with excitement and dissipation woe woe to the young heart that had linked its fate with his why was it marked for desolation why were the happy feelings of youth to be blasted in their budding for many months did maurice continue in his reckless course of dissipation heeding not the tears of his fond wife the reproving counsel of her mother old associations were too strong upon him the giant grasp of vice was too powerful for his weak mind his companions were wild and heedless where cared they for household ties for the opinion of the world drinking gambling and wrangling were their amusements home had no thoughts for them many of them had none and they often slept in the very place where they had held their hellish orgies but this course of things could not last long the heart of gertrude was breaking the mother was drooping with anxiety for her daughter's health and happiness everything went unfortunately they were pressed with creditors to whom they could give no excuse one thing after another went from their comfortable household to meet their necessary emergencies until finally they were reduced to what was merely necessary for their actual comfort there was no hope no expectation of reform in maurice he had passed the rubicon whence there was no returning one cold night in winter when the wind whistled and the snow drifted into heaps maurice was returning home from his riotous departure the fumes of the wine made his brain reel he was maddened with continued losses and he was also suffering from a severe beating which he had received from one of his companions whom he had accused of robbing him and who had kept himself more cool and free from liquor than had denning he was raving like a madman incoherently and violently but evidently getting more quiet as he proceeded for the effects of a parting glass were stealing over his brain what with the blast the snow and his intoxication he made his way slowly and with difficulty toward his home his blood almost freezing in his veins and himself trembling like an aspen all that weary tedious night did the weeping wife wait vainly for her husband's return she thought over her innocent maiden days and she could see no cause why her affliction should be so great she recollected her mother's warning but it was now too late to escape the misery that encompassed her patiently and with prayer must she wait her fate trusting in the great disposer of events to soften her affliction or make her strength equal to the burden she cared not so much for her own comfortless situation as for the happiness and reformation of her erring husband what is the mystery in human nature that the innocent must suffer oft times for the faults of the sinning daylight had scarcely streaked the east on the following morning ere gertrude hastened to the door of her dwelling for her ears had caught as she fancied strange sounds and all through the long night had she watched for her husband's return he came not the wind whistled shrilly around her dwelling and everything seemed snapping with the sharp frost tremblingly did she open the door and the cold snow blew into her face she looked out how dismal the air no living thing seemed stirring she would have stepped back but her eyes caught a sight of unnatural horror and with a wild shriek she fell upon the floor there in the grey light frozen and stiff sat the lifeless form of maurice denny his ghastly features were like marble and he seemed a sculptured form carved by a demon spirit he had been only able to reach his home and too intoxicated and chilled by the cold to open the door he had sunk down upon the step where sleep and death had overtaken him a dreadful lesson to the inebriate for many weeks there was grief and mourning in that house of misfortune but the kindness of friends in time softened their grief and they learned to consider those things which had afflicted them as in the end a permanent blessing a small property which gertrude shortly after inherited gave her the means of comfort in a few years after she was married again happily and prosperously and she lived to enjoy many days of contentment and peace and she often took occasion to impress upon her young friends the error of disregarding a mother's warning end of section one section two of the rover volume one number eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by alexander judy the rover volume one number eight edited by seba smith and lawrence labrie section two the tempter a tale of jerusalem it was fast approaching the eleventh hour 
The busy hum of the holy city had sunk into comparative stillness, and save some straggling wayfarers and a field laborers returning from their daily toil, few passengers were to be seen in the streets of Jerusalem. One middle-aged man alone kept his seat in the water gate, looking with placid smile along the rugged road which led down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. A silver gira was held between his fingers, as in the act of giving an alms, but for some minutes no object appeared on whom it might properly be bestowed. He rose from his seat, and gathering his flowing robe around him, was preparing to depart, when the figure of an aged man tottering slowly up the steep arrested his attention. The old man was meanly clad, and as he leant feebly on his staff to take a breath after his toilsome ascent, his glance rested upon the person of the sage Rabbi Abimelech, for it was he who sat in the gate distributing his daily alms to the poor, the hungry, and the wayfarer. The Lord direct thy goings out and thy comings in, said the rabbi with a self-satisfied smile, dropping the coin into the extended palm of the stranger. Lo, I have tarried from the ninth hour until the towers and pinnacles of the temple have thrown their dark shadows across the brook of Cedron, even unto the base of the Mount of Olives, to bestow this last gira of forty in an alms according to a vow which I made last Pentecost, and behold, thou art here to receive it. Precious is the gift which comes from the heart, more precious than the Arabian frankincense, and sweeter than the rich honey of Hebron. If I might know my Lord's name, my heart would not forget it when I lift up my voice in prayer to the ruler of Israel, said the stranger respectively. I am called the Rabbi Abimelech, he whom men term the sinless, whose voice is as the neighing of a war-horse in the temple, whose works are of the works of righteousness, who clothes the naked, feeds the hungry, and gives alms to the tenth part of his substance, asked the stranger. The same, answered the self-glorified Rabbi. And now... Let me pray of thee thy name, and in what city thou art the dweller. Alas, answered the stranger, I am as a reproach to my kindred, and my name is a defilement to the lips of an Israelite. Unfortunate man, and what hast thou offended against the law? In this thing have I offended. Behold, I went forth at the last vintage season into the vineyards, and the vintagers were pressing the grapes in the wine-presses, and the red wine ran into the vats, even the red wine of Lebanon. And being weary with the heat and toil of the day, I was tempted. In foolishness I did drink of the wine, which should have been an abomination unto me, seeing that I am a Nazarite from my youth. The scrupulous rabbi shrank from the degraded Israelite as from a tainted leper, and elevating his brow with a sanctimonious air, the way of the wise man is pleasant, but the feet of the fool treadeth in the mire. Stop, said the stranger as the rabbi was departing. Is it not also said that the vain glorious man shall fall in the snares of his own proud heart? Rabbi Abimelech, thy life has been righteous, but fire hath not yet tried, nor water purified thee. See that thou stand fast when the time cometh. At these words, the stranger, with more alertness than his seemingly feebleness indicated, turned into an obscure street, while Abimelech, pondering on the warning of the strange man, took his way towards his own dwelling. On reaching his own house, Abimelech retired to his own chamber. It was a small closet or oratory on the housetop, furnished in a style of simplicity approaching to rudeness, and its cold, cheerless appearance was increased by the dim twilight. There was still, however, sufficient light for Abimelech to distinguish a female figure standing in a thoughtful attitude in the center of the apartment. A rich, mellow ray fell upon her shape, which exceeded in height the usual standard of her sex, but was so exquisitely proportioned as to convey only an idea of graceful dignity to the beholder. 
Her eye, as she turned it upon Abimelech, seemed dark and lustrous, and her smile was a sunbeam upon the bosom of the still waters. The rabbi stood motionless, for he never before had seen or beheld such beauty. A new pulse stirred in his bosom, and an unusual fire burned in his veins. At length he found words to express his admiration and astonishment. "'Fair damsel!' cried he. "'Thy visit is unforeseen, but thou art more welcome to my chamber than the pleasant odor of the young vines in the spring season.' "'I am,' said the abashed intruder, while a rosette blush overspread the marble whiteness of her soft cheek and lofty brow. "'I am, as you may perceive, a stranger and a Gentile, unworthy to come beneath the roof of the far-famed Rabbi Abimelech.' the words of whose lips are wisdom and whose precepts are as pearls of great price. Nevertheless, let thy handmaiden find favor in thy sight, and turn aside, I pray thee, unto my lodgings, which are nigh at hand, and let thy handmaiden rejoice in the light of countenance, in the sweet sound of thy voice. The rabbi, though surprised at the novel address, felt a strange sensation thrill through his frame. Gazing upon the lovely speaker, his resolution began to waver, and almost unconsciously he permitted himself to be led out by his unknown visitor. Proceeding at a rapid pace towards the western quarter of the city, they at length stopped before a house of handsome exterior, but which Abimelech could not ever remember having seen before. A single tap at the door caused it to open, and the rabbi, still following his mysterious conductor, entered a hall, feebly lighted by a single lamp. Here she motioned him to remain for a short time, and disappearing through a passage, the rabbi was left alone to meditate upon the strange adventure in which he was engaged. But he had little time allowed him for reflection, ere the heavy folds of a curtain which overhung a small door were partially withdrawn, and a fair hand and a sweet, soft voice invited him to enter. He approached, lifted up the curtain, and held a superbly furnished apartment, lit with silver lamps fed with perfumed oil of Samaria. Mirrors of polished metal hung around the room, while on a low couch sat, or rather reclined, the beautiful stranger, whose charms now shone with a splendor far surpassing anything the rabbi could imagine of mortal mold. He essayed to speak, but the words dwelt upon his lips. She beckoned him to take a seat beside her. He obeyed tremblingly, but the gentle, assuring smile which she cast upon him at once banished his timidity and he suffered his eyes to wander in unrestrained freedom over those voluptuous beauties, till the sight became painful from extreme delight. A female attendant spread before them a light but luxurious repast of fresh and dried fruits, grapes, figs, apricots, olives, pomegranates and dates, interspersed with pots of pure honey, rose cakes of Damascus, and bananas of Rosetta, with Egyptian syrup and crystal vases in which the rich wine of Holbin sparkled with tempting brilliancy. Fairest of the daughters of men, may I crave thy name and that of thy father's house, said the rabbi, addressing his unknown companion. My name is Zora, replied the damsel. My father is of the children of Ishmael, an abider in the desert. The fame of the sage Abimelech has reached unto the farthest borders of the wilderness, and behold, the heart of thy handmaiden was moved to see thy man, of whose wisdom all nations spake. Lovely Zora, exclaimed the enamored sage, my wisdom is become as withered grass before thy beauty, and the strength of my heart as dew in the consuming light of thine eyes. Suffer me, therefore, to be unto thee even as Boaz was unto Ruth, and to love thee with the love wherewith Jacob loved Rachel. Zora smiled at the earnestness with which these words were uttered, and filling the cup, presented it to the delighted rabbi, who instinctively shrank from the dangerous libation, but Zora would not be denied. Urge me not, fair damsel, 
said he. I have a vow against the juice of the vine until next new moon. Zora's countenance fell, and the big tear hung trembling on her dark eyes' silken lash. Abimelech, torn with conflicting passions, passed his arms around her waist and drew her unresistingly to his bosom. He felt the quick pulses of her heart throb against his. Her warm sighs were upon his cheek, and the perfumed wine at his lips. Human strength could resist no longer. He seized the cup with desperate hands, and at a single draught quaffed it to the bottom. His vow was broken, and having nothing farther to hope or fear, drought followed drought in quick succession, till his flushed cheeks and sparkling eyes bore evidence that he was no longer under the dominion of reason. Zora, my beautiful Zora, cried he, my love for thee is as the love which floods cannot quench, nor many waters drown. Thou art the light of mine eyes. I cannot part from thee. Let us therefore flee unto my father's tents, even unto the wilderness as unto a city of refuge. Ah, my lord, thy servant hath neither gold nor silver to bear the charge. Could we live like the raven or the stork of the desert? This objection had not struck Abimelech before. He was rich himself, but he could not immediately convert his possessions into money, and his passion was too violent to admit delay. He seemed perplexed, and spake not, till Zora inquired in a careless manner if his next-door neighbor was not the rich publican Aaron bin Rabiat. "'It is even so,' replied the rabbi, still musing. "'And he hath, I am told, coffers filled with shekels of pure silver?' "'It is said so.' and shekels of gold, and pots of double Maccabees, and precious stones, pearls, and sardonyx, and carbuncles, more costly than the jewels of the high priest's breastplate? Ha! <laughs> exclaimed Abimelech, as if a sudden ray of light had darted across his mind. Speak on. Aaron bin Rabiat is stricken in years, and liveth alone. Riches are to him as the dust of the earth. There is a private way from thy house into his. Stop, stop, cried the agitated man, grasping the arm of the tempter convulsively. What wouldst thou? Shall I peril my soul in this thing? Zora, Zora, thy words are pleasant to my ears as the murmurs of falling waters in the desert. But the bitterness of Mara, even the bitterness of death, is their taste. Nevertheless, and this also I will obey thee. Go about it then, instantly, said Zora, rising. Thou knowest the private passage into the old miser's chamber. Take this weapon, thou mayest need it. And when thou hast secured the treasure, return quickly hither, and all things shall be ready for our flight. Abimelech, whose scruples had by this time completely vanished, was no less eager than his impetus mistress to accomplish the deed. He ran with incredible speed through the now silent streets, and quickly reached his own dwelling. Lighting a small lamp, he entered a private passage which in time of danger had been contrived between the two houses, and in a few moments found himself in the strong chamber of Aaron bin Rabiat. Around him lay coffers filled with gold and silver coins, and casks charged with precious stones that trembled with varied but incessant luster in the sickly beams of the lamp he bore. He had raised one jeweled box to his eye to examine it more closely when slipping from his fingers it fell to the floor with a loud crash, and the next moment the alarmed miser rushed into the apartment. Seeing a stranger at such an hour in the sanctuary of the god of his idol tree, he uttered a piercing scream, and throwing himself upon the robber, grappled him with almost supernatural strength. Vainly did Abimelech endeavor to escape from the old man's grasp, or to still his screams. Every moment increased his danger. He heard the steps of persons ascending the stairs. Not an instant was to be lost. The dagger which Zora had given him was in his girdle. He drew it and plunged it into the heart of the old man. 
A piercing shriek run through the chamber, and the unfortunate Aaron bin Rabiat fell lifeless on the floor. Instead of providing for his safety, the guilty rabbi stood petrified with horror over the quivering body of his victim, watching the life stream welling from his side in a bubbling tide. When the persons attracted by the publican's screams entered the room, he made no attempt to escape, but surrendered himself quietly into their hands. He was instantly hurried to the prison, and amidst the revilings of the crowd was plunged into a dark, noisome dungeon to await the public ignominy of a trial on the following day in the sight of that people before whom he had set himself up as an example of righteousness. Dashing himself on the earth, he lay withering in bitter agony, cursing the hour of his birth in the initial madness which had led his steps from the paths of virtue, when suddenly a ray of light illuminated his prison. He looked up. It was Zora. Her eyes, dark orbs, still shone with undiminished luster, but there was in the proud smile which curled her elevated lip an expression of demonic triumph which chilled the rabbi's blood. Hiding his face in his robe, he exclaimed, "'False tempter, be gone! I have done thy bidding, and lo, innocent blood is upon my hands. I am broken and trodden underfoot like a defiled thing. The cup of my pride has been filled with gall. Depart! Depart, therefore, I pray thee, lest in the bitterness of my wrath I curse thee also.' Rabbi Abimelech, it is said, the vain glorious man shall fall in the snare of his own heart. The time hath come, and thou couldst not stand fast. Raka, art thou there? shouted Abimelech, as he recognized in the speaker the voice of the mendicant to whom he had given alms at the water gate on the previous evening. Burning with rage, he seized the prophet of evil by the throat, but the strength of the old man far exceeded his own, and he flung him to the earth with a violence that shook his frame. Starting up, he beheld not the old beggar of the water gate, nor the tempter of Zora. He was alone, not in the dungeon of a prison, but in his little chamber, with a yellow harvest moon streaming through the lattice. Several minutes elapsed before he could convince himself that the horrors he had undergone were but the airy painting of a dream, and then, prostrating himself on the ground, he exclaimed in the fullness of his heart, It is a lesson from the Lord. I was proud of my own strength, and when the trial came I was delivered to the evil one. From that day forth, Rabbi Abimelech walked in the path of humility. He had experienced the dangers of self-confidence, and he learned to pity rather than condemn those who, like himself, had fallen in struggle with the tempter. End of section two. Section three of The Rover, volume one, number eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rover, Volume 1, Number 8, edited by Seba Smith and Lawrence Labrie. Section 3 Passion, its history. It was evening, clear and frosty. I stood in one of the small and deserted streets that intersect Mayfair, waiting for Julia. Yes, our attachment had now progressed to that point. We met, alone and in secret. From the hour Julia first consented to these interviews, as Modius left me, I have not seen him since my gratitude stops here said he it was my task to amuse to interest you but no more i deal not with the passions i can do nothing for you in this affair you are in love and in the hands 
of a stronger demon than myself adieu when the spell is broken we may meet again with those words he vanished and has i suspect engaged his services for the present to the marquis of hartford i was waiting then in this lonely street for the coming of julia i heard the clock strike eight the appointed hour but i saw not her dark mantle and graceful form emerging from the cross street which led to our rendezvous and who was julia and what she was a relation of the gaming adventurer at whose house and with whose daughter i had first seen her and she lived at a somewhat distant part of the town with a sister who was a widow and much older than herself occupied in the business of an extensive trade and the cares of a growing family this sister left julia to the guidance of her own susceptible fancy and youthful inexperience left her to reflect to imagine to act as she would and the consequences was that she fell in love she was thoroughly guileless and almost thoroughly ignorant she could read indeed but only novels and those not of the gravest she could write but in no fluent hand and if her heart taught her the sentiment that supplies skill her diffidence forbade her to express it she was quiet melancholy yet quickly moved to mirth sensitive and yet pure i afterward discovered that pride was her prevailing characteristic but at first it lay concealed i already loved her even for her deficiencies for they were not of nature but of education and who and what is her lover long as i have been relating these adventures i have not yet communicated that secret writing about myself i have not yet disclosed myself i will now do so i am then an idle wandering unmarried man rich well-born still young who has read much written somewhat and lived for pleasure action and the hour keeping thought for study but excluding it from enterprise and ready to plunge into any plan or any pursuit so that it promised the excitement of something new such a life engenders more of remembrance than of hope it flings our dreams back upon the past instead of urging them to the future it gives us excitement in retrospection but satiety when we turn toward the years to come the pleasure of youth is a costly draught in which the pearl that should enrich our manhood is dissolved and so much for julia's lover the best thing in his favour is that she loves him the half-hour has passed will she come how my heart beats the night is clear and bright what can have delayed her i hear feet ah julia it is you indeed julia took my arm and pressed it silently i drew aside her veil and beneath the lamp looked into her face she was weeping and what is the matter dearest my sister has discovered your last letter to me i dropped it and and heavens how could you be so imprudent but i hope it is no matter what does your sister say that that i ought to see you no more she is kind but you will not obey her my julia i cannot help it why surely you can come out when you like no i have promised not she has been a kind sister to me sir and and she spoke so kindly now on this matter that i could not help promising and i cannot break my promise though i may break my heart is there no way of compromising the matter said i after a pause no way of seeing me my julia you will not desert me now but what can i do said julia simply my angel surely the promise was not willingly given it was extorted from you no sir i gave it with all my heart i thank you pray pray do not speak so coldly you must you must own it was very wrong in me ever to see you and how could this end god knows but not to my good and my family's honour i never thought much about it before and went on and on till i got entangled and did not dare look much back or much forward but now you see when my sister began to show me all the folly i have committed i was frightened and 
and in short it's no use talking i can meet you no more but i shall at least see you at your relations the miss four stars no sir i promised also not to go there and not to go anywhere without my sister confound your sister i muttered with the most conscientious heartiness you give me up then said i aloud without a sigh and without a struggle julia wept on without answering my heart softened to her and my conscience smote myself was not the sister right had i not been selfishly reckless of consequences was it not now my duty to be generous and even if generous answered passion will do you be happy have not matters already gone so far that her heart is implicated without recall to leave her is to leave her to be wretched we walked quietly on neither speaking never before had i felt how dearly i loved this innocent and charming girl and loving her so dearly a feeling for her began to preponderate over the angry and bitter mortification i had first experienced for myself my mind was confused and bewildered i knew not which course to pursue we had gone on thus mute for several minutes when at the corner of a street which led her homewards julia turned and said in a faltering voice farewell sir god bless you let us part here i must go home now the street was utterly empty the lamps few and at long intervals left the place where we stood in shade i saw her countenance only imperfectly through the low long bonnet which modestly as it were shrouded its fearful loveliness i drew my arm round her kissed her lips and said be it as you think best for yourself go and be happy think no more of me julia paused hesitated as about to speak then shook her head gently and still silent as if the voice were choked within lowered her veil and walked away when she had got a few paces she turned back and seeing that i stood still in the same spot gazing upon her her courage seemed to her she returned placed her hand in mine and said in a soft whisper you are not angry with me you will not hate me julia to the last hour of my life i shall adore you that i do not reproach you that i do not tamper with your determination is the greatest proof of the real and deep love i bear to you but go go or i shall not be so generous long now julia was quite a child in mind more than years and her impulses were childlike and after a little pause and a little evident embarrassment she drew from her finger a pretty though plain ring that i had once admired and she said very timidly if sir you will condescend to accept this i heard no more i vow that my heart melted within me at once and the tears ran down my cheek almost as fast as they did down julia's the incident was so simple the sentiment to veiled was so touching and so youthful i took the ring and kissed it julia yet lingered i saw what was at her heart though she dared not say it she wished also for some little remembrance of the link that had been between us but she would not take the chain i pressed upon her it was too costly and the only gift that pleased her and she at last accepted was a ring not half the value even of her own this little interchange and the more gentle and less passionate feelings to which it gave birth seemed to console her and when she left me it was with a steadier step and a less drooping air poor julia i stayed in that desolate spot 
to the last glimpse of thy light form vanished from my gaze in the whole course of life there is no passage in it so weary stale and unprofitable as that which follows some episode of passion abruptly broken off still loving yet forbid the object we love the heart sinks beneath the weight of its own craving affections there is no event to the day a burdensome listlessness a weary and distasteful apathy fill up the dull flatness of the hours time creeps before us visibly we see his hour-glass and his scythe and we lose all the charm of life the moment we are made sensible of its presence i resolve to travel i fix the day of my departure would to heaven that i had been permitted to carry at least that purpose into effect about three days before the one i had appointed for leaving london i met suddenly in the street my friend anne the eldest of the damsels to whom i had played the sorcerer she knew of course of my love for julia and had assisted in our interviews i found that she now knew of our separation she had called upon julia and the sister had told her all and remonstrated with her for her connivance at our attachment the girl described the present condition of julia in the most melancholy colours she said she passed the day alone and the widow had confessed for the most part in tears that she had already lost her colour and roundness of form that her health was breaking beneath an effort which her imperfect education feeding her imagination at the expense of the reasoning faculty and furnishing her with no resources so ill prepared her to sustain and with her sister however well-meaning she had no sympathy she found in her no support and seldom even companionship this account produced a great revulsion in my mind hitherto i had at least consoled myself with the belief that i had acted in the true spirit of tenderness to julia and in that hope i had supported myself now all thought of prudence virtue vanished beneath the idea of her unhappiness i returned home and in the impulse of the moment wrote to her a passionate imploring letter i besought her to fly with me i committed the letter to my servant a foreigner well used to such commissions and in a state of breathless fever i awaited the reply it came the address was in julia's writing i opened it with a sort of transport my own letter was returned unopened the cover contained these few words i have pledged myself to return your letters in case you should write to me and so i keep my word i dare not dare not open this for i cannot tell you what it cost me to keep my resolution i had no idea that it would be so impossible to forget you that i should be so unhappy but though i will not trust myself to read what you have written i know well how full of kindness every word is and feel as if i had read the letter and it makes me wickedly happy to think you have not yet forgotten me though you soon must pray do not write to me again i beseech you not as you value the little peace that is left to me and so sir no more from julia who prays for you night and day and will think of you as long as she lives what was i to do after the receipt of this letter so artless was julia that every word that ought to have dissuaded me from molesting her more seemed to make it imperative to refrain and what a corroboration in these lines of all i had been told i waited till dark i repaired with my servant to that part of the town 
in which julia's sister resided i reconnoitred the house and how asked i for the first time of my servant how louis did you convey the letter i went sir first answered louis to the young lady miss julia's cousin in that street and asked if i could not carry any parcel to her relation she understood me and gave me one i slipped the letter into the parcel and calling at the private entrance of the house desired the maid who opened the door to give it only to miss julia i made sure of the servant with half a guinea miss julia herself came down and gave me the answer ha and you saw her then not her face sir for she had put on her bonnet and she did not detain me a moment in this account there was no clue to the apartment which belonged to julia and that was now my main object to discover i trusted however greatly to the ingenuity and wit of my confidant and a little to my own it was a corner house large rambling old-fashioned one side of the house ran down a dark and narrow street the other faced a broad and public thoroughfare in walking to and fro the former street i at length saw a sudden light in a window of the second floor and julia herself yes herself appeared for one moment at the window i recognized her gentle profile her parted hair and then she drew down the curtain all was darkness and a blank that then was her apartment at least i had some right to conjecture so how to gain it was still the question rope ladders exist only in romances beside the policemen and the passengers the maid-servant flashed across me might she not bought over to the minor indulgence be purchased also to the greater one i called my servant and bade him attempt the task after a little deliberation he rang at the bell luck favoured me the same servant as before answered the summons i remained at a distance shrouded in my cloak at length the door closed louis joined me the servant had consented to admit me two hours hence i might then see julia undetected the girl according to louis was more won over by compassion for julia's distress whom she imagined compelled by her sister to reject the addresses of a true lover than even by the bribe in two hours the sister would have retired to rest the house would be still oh heavens what a variety of burning emotions worked upon me and stifled remorse nay even fear lest we should attract observation by lingering for so long a time about the spot i retired from the place at present i returned at the appointed hour i was admitted all was dark the servant who was a very young girl herself conducted me up the narrow stairs we came to julia's door a light broke through the chinks and under the threshold and now for the first time i faltered i trembled the colour fled my cheeks my knees knocked together by a violent effort i conquered my emotion what was to be done if i entered without premeditation julia in her sudden alarm might rouse the house if i sent in a servant to acknowledge i was there she might yet refuse to see me no this one interview i would insist upon this latter course was the best the only one i bade the girl then prepare her young mistress for my presence she entered and shut the door i sat down at the threshold conceive all i felt as i sat there listening to the loud beating of my own heart the girl did not come out time passed i heard julia's voice within and there seemed fear agony in its tone i could wait no more i opened her door gently and stood before her the fire burned low and clear in the grate one candle assisted its partial light there was a visible air of purity of maidenhood about the whole apartment that struck an instant reverence into my heart books in small shelves hung upon the wall julia's work lay upon a table near the fire 
the bed stood at a little distance with its white simple drapery in all was that quiet and spotless neatness which is as a type of the inmate's mind my eye took the whole scene at a glance and julia herself reclined on a chair her head buried in her hands sobbing violently and the maid pale and terrified having lost all presence of mind all attempt to cheer her mistress much less to persuade i threw myself at julia's feet and attempted to seize her hand she started up with a faint cry of terror you she said with keen reproach i did not expect this from you go go what would you have what could you think of me at this hour in this room and as she said the last words she again hid her face with her hands but only for a moment go she exclaimed in a sterner voice go instantly or or what julia you will raise the house do so in the face of all foes or friends i will demand the right to see and speak with you this night and alone now summon the house in the name of indomitable love i swear that i will be heard julia only waved her hand in yet stronger agitation than before what do you fear i resumed in a softer whisper is it i i who for your sake gave up even the attempt to see you till now and now what brings me hither a selfish purpose no it is for your happiness that i come julia i fancied you well at ease forgetting me and i bore my own wretchedness without a murmur i heard of you ill pining living only on the past i forgot all prudence and i am here now do you blame me or do you yet imagine that this love is of a nature which you have cause to fear answer me julia i cannot i cannot here and now go i implore you and to-morrow i will see you this night or never said i rising and folding my arms julia turned round gazing on my face with so anxious so inquiring so alarmed a look that it checked my growing courage then turning to the servant she grasped her firmly by the arm and muttered you will not leave me julia have i deserved this be yourself and be just to me not here i say not here cried julia in so vehement a tone that i feared it might alarm the house hush hush well then said i come downstairs doubtless the sitting-room below is vacant enough there then let me see you only for a few minutes and i will leave you contented and blessing your name i will said julia gaspingly go i will follow you promise yes yes i promise enough i am satisfied once more i descended the stairs and sat myself quietly on the last step i did not wait many moments shading the light with her hand julia stole down opened a door in the passage we were in a little parlour the gaping servant was about also to enter i whispered her to stay without julia did not seem to observe or to heed this perhaps in this apartment connected with all the associations of daylight and safety she felt herself secure she appeared too to look round the little room with a satisfied air and her face though very pale had lost its aspect of fear the room was cold and looked desolate enough god knows the furniture all disarranged and scattered the table strewed with litter the rug turned up and the ashes in the grate but julia here suffered me to take her hand and julia here leant upon my bosom and i kissed away the tears from her eyes and she confessed she had been very very unhappy then with all the power that love gives us over the one beloved 
that soft despotism which melts away the will i urged my suit to julia and implored her to let us become the world to each other and julia had yet the virtue to refuse and her frank simplicity had already half restored my own better angel to myself when i heard a slight alarmed scream from the servant without an angry voice the door opened i saw a female whom i was at no loss to conjecture must be julia's sister what a picture it made the good lady with her bonnet de nuit and her but alas the story is too serious for jest yet imagine how the small things of life interfere with its great events the widow had come down to look for her keys that she had left behind the pathetic the passionate all marred by a bunch of keys she looked hard at me before she even deigned to regard my companion and then approaching us she took julia roughly enough by the arm go upstairs go she said how have you deceived me and you sir what do you hear who are you my dear lady take a chair and let us have some rational conversation sir do you mean to insult me how can you imagine i do leave the house this instant or i shall order in the policeman not you how will i not julia glad of an escape had already glided from the room madam said i listen to me i will not leave this apartment until i have exonerated your sister from all blame in this interview i entered the house unknown to her i went at once to her own room you start it was so i speak the truth i insisted on speaking to her as i insist on speaking to you now and if you will not hear me know the result it is this i will visit this house guarded as you can day and night i will visit it until it hold julia no more until she is mine is this the language of a man you can control come be seated and hear me the mistress of the house mechanically took a chair we conversed together for more than an hour and i found that julia had been courted the year before by a man in excellent circumstances of her own age and her own station in life that she had once appeared disposed to favour his suit and that since she had known me she had rejected it the sister was very anxious she should now accept it she appealed to me whether i should persevere in a suit that could not end honourably to julia to the exclusion of one that would secure to her affluence respectability a station and a home i was struck by this appeal the widow was like most of her class a shrewd and worldly woman enough she followed up the advantage she had gained and at length emboldened by my silence and depending greatly on my evident passion for julia she threw out a pretty broad hint that the only way to finish the dispute fairly was to marry julia myself now if there be any propensity common to a sensible man of the world it is suspicion i immediately suspected that i was to be taken in could julia connive at this had her reserve so great yet her love so acknowledged been lures to fascinate me into the snare i did not yield to the suspicion but somehow or other it remained half unconsciously on my mind so great was my love for julia that had it been less suddenly formed i might have sacrificed all and married her but in sudden passions there is no esteem you are ashamed you are afraid of indulging them to their full extent you feel that as yet you are the dupe 
if not of others at least of your own senses and the very knowledge of the excess of your passion put you on your guard lest you should be betrayed by it i said nothing in answer to the widow's suggestion but i suffered her to suppose from my manner that it might have its effect i left the house after an amicable compromise on my part i engaged not to address julia herself any more on the widow's part she promised that on applying to her she would suffer me at any time to see julia even alone for the next two days i held a sharp contest with myself could i with love still burning in every vein consent to renounce julia yet could i consent to deprive her of the holy and respected station she had it in her power to hold to pursue my suit to accomplish its purpose in her degradation a third choice was left me should i obey the sister's hint and proffer marriage marriage with one beautiful indeed simple amiable but without birth education without sympathy with myself in a single thought or habit be the fool of my own desire and purchase what i had the sense to feel must be a discontented and ill-mated life for the mere worship of external qualities yet yet in a word i felt as if i could arrive at no decision myself i remembered an old friend and adviser of my youth to him then i resolved to apply for counsel john mannering is about sixty years of age he is of a mild temper of great experience of kindly manners and of a morality which professes to be practicable rather than strict he had guided me from many errors in the earlier part of my life but he had impressed no clear principle on my mind in order to guide myself his own virtue was without system the result of a good heart though not an ardent one and a mind which did not aspire beyond a certain elevation not from the want of a clear sense but of enthusiasm such as he was he was the best adviser i knew of for he was among the few who can sympathize with your feelings as well as your interests with him i conversed long and freely his advice was obvious to renounce julia i went home i reasoned with myself i sat down and began twenty letters i tore them all in a rage i could not help picturing to my mind julia pining and in despair and in affecting to myself to feel only for her i compassionated my own situation at length love prevailed over all i resolved to call on the widow to request permission to be allowed to visit julia at her house and without promising marriage still to pay her honourable courtship with a view of ascertaining if our tempers and dispositions were as congenial as our hearts i fancied such a proposition seemed exceedingly reasonable and common-sense like i shut my eyes to the consequences and knowing how malleable is the nature of women in youth i pleased myself with that notion which has deceived so many visionaries that i should be able to perfect her education and that after a few years travel on the continent i might feel as proud of her mind as i was now transported with her person meanwhile how tempting was the compromise with my feelings i should see her converse with her live in the atmosphere of her presence the next day i called on the sister whose dark shrewd eye sparkled at my proposition all was arranged i saw julia with what smiles and tears she threw herself in my arms i was satisfied and happy and now i called every day and every day saw julia but after the first interview the charm was broken i saw with new eyes the sister commercial to the backbone of her soul was delighted indeed at the thought of the step in life her sister was to make julia was evidently impressed by the widow's joy 
and visions of splendour evidently mingled with those of love what more natural love perhaps predominated over all but was it possible that in a young and imaginative mind the worldly vanity should be wholly dormant yet it was natural also that my suspicion should be roused that i should fear i was deceived that i might have been designedly led on to this step that what had seemed nature in julia was in reality art i looked in her face and its sunny and beautiful candour reassured me but the moment afterward the thought forced itself upon me again i recalled also the instances i had ever known of unequal marriages and i fancied i saw unhappiness in all it seemed to me in all that the superior had been palpably duped thus a coldness insensibly crept over the wonted ardour of my manner and instead of that blessed thoughtlessness that elysian credulity with which lovers should give themselves up to the transport of the hour and imagine that each is the centre of all perfection i became restless and vigilant forever sifting motives and diving deeper than the sweet surface of the present time my mind thus influenced the delusion that conceals all faults and uncongenialities gradually evaporated i noted a thousand things in julia that made me start at the notion of seeing her become my wife so long as marriage had not entered into my views so long those faults had not touched me had passed unheeded i saw her now with other eyes when i sought in her love and beauty alone i was contented to ask no more at present i sought more she was to become the companion of a life and i was alarmed nay i even exaggerated the petty causes of my displeasure and inelegance of expression a negligence of conversational forms fretted and irritated me in her far more than they would have done in one of my own station when love first becomes reasonable it soon afterwards grows unjust i did not scruple to communicate to julia all the little occurrences of the day or little points in her manner that had annoyed me and i found that she did not take my suggestions mild and guarded as they were in a manner i thought i had a right to expect she had been accustomed to see me enamoured of her lightest word or gesture she was not prepared to find me now cavilling and reproving her face always ingenuous evinced at once her mortification at the change she thought me always in the wrong wearisome exacting and unjust she never openly resented at first merely pouted out her pretty lip and was silent for the next half hour but by degrees my beautiful julia began to evince traces of a spirit a spirit not indeed unfeminine and never loud a spirit of sorrow rather than anger i was ungenerous she said i had never found these faults before i had never required all this perfection and then she wept and that went to my heart and i was not satisfied with myself till she smiled again but it was easy to perceive that from taking pleasure in each other's society we grew by degrees to find embarrassment the fear of a quarrel discontent and a certain pain supplying the place of eager and all-absorbing rapture and when i looked to the future i trembled in a word i repeat once more the charm was gone o oh, epic in the history of human passions when that phrase is spoken what volumes does it not convey what bitter what irremediable disappointment what dread conviction of the fallacy of hope and the false colouring of imagination what a chill and dark transition from life as we fancied it to life as it is in the arabian tale when one eye was touched with the mystic ointment all the treasures of the earth became visible and the sterile rock was transformed 
into mines of inexhaustible wealth but when the same spell is extended to both eyes the delusion vanishes the earth relapses into its ancient barrenness and the mind fades once more into the desert so in the experience of the passions while we are as yet but partially the creatures of the enchantment we are blessed with a power to discover glory in all things we are as magicians we are as gods we are not contented we demand more custom touches both eyes and lo the vision is departed and we are alone in the wilderness again one evening after one of our usual quarrels and reconciliations julia's spirits seemed raised into more than usual reaction there were three or four of her friends present a sort of party her cousins the fortune seekers among the rest and she was the life of the circle in proportion to her gaiety was my discontent i fancy she combined with the confounded widow who evidently wanted to show me off in her own damnable phrase as her sister's wooer and this is a position in which no tolerably fastidious man likes to be placed add to this my readers very well know that people who have no inelegance when subdued throw off a thousand little grossierities when they are elated no ordeal is harder for a young and lovely woman who has not been brought up conventionally to pass with grace than that of her own unrestrained merriment levity requires polish in proportion to your interest in the person who indulges it and levity in his mistress is almost always displeasing to a passionate lover love is so very grave and so very refined a deity in short every instant added to my secret vexation i absolutely coloured with rage at every jest bandied between poor julia and her companions i swear i think i could have beat her with a safe conscience the party went now came my turn i remonstrated julia replied we both lost our temper i fancied then i was entirely in the right but now alas i will believe myself wrong it is some sacrifice to a dread memory to own it you always repine at my happiness said julia to be merry is always in your eyes a crime i cannot bear this tyranny i am not your wife and if i were i would not bear it if i displease you now what shall i do hereafter but my dear julia you can so easily avoid the little peculiarities i dislike believe me unreasonable perhaps i am so it is some pleasure to a generous mind to sacrifice to the unreasonableness of one we love in a word i own it frankly if you meet all my wishes with this obstinacy we cannot be happy and and i see interrupted julia with unwonted vehemence i see what you would say you are tired of me you feel that i do not suit your ideal notions you thought me all perfect when you designed me for your victim but now that you think something is to be sacrificed on your part you think only of the paltry sacrifice and demand of me an impossible perfection in return there was so much truth in this reproach that it stung me to the quick it was indelicate perhaps in julia to use it it was certainly unwise i turned pale with anger madam i began with that courtesy which conveys all reproach madam repeated julia turning suddenly round her lips parted her eyes flashing through her tears alarm grief but also indignation quivering in every muscle is it come to this go let us part my love ceases since i see yours is over were you twice as wealthy twice as proud i would not humble myself to be beholden to your justice instead of your affection rather rather o oh god rather would i have sacrificed myself given up all to you than accept one advantage from the man who considers it an honour let us part julia had evidently conceived the word i had used in cold and bitter respect as an irony on her station as well as a proof of coldness but i did not stop to consider whether or not she was reasonably provoked her disdain for the sacrifice i thought so great galled me the violence of her passion revolted i thought only of the escape she offered me let us part rang in my ear like a reprieve to a convict i rose at once took my hat calmly and not till i reached the door did i reply enough julia we part for ever you will hear from me to-morrow for the last time 
i left the house and trod as on air my love for julia long decreasing seemed crushed at once i imagined her former gentleness all hypocrisy i thought only of the termagant i had escaped i congratulated myself that she having broke the chain i was free and with honour i did not bend no nor till it was too late recall the despair printed on her hueless face when the calm low voice of my resolution broke upon her ear and she saw that she had indeed lost me for ever that image rises before me to my grave her features pale and locked the pride the resentment all sunk merged in one incredulous wild stony aspect of deserted love alas alas could i but have believed that she felt so deeply wrote to her the next day kindly and temperately but such a tone made the wound deeper i bade her farewell for ever to her sister i wrote more fully i said that our tempers were so thoroughly unsuited that no rational hope of happiness in our union could exist for either i besought her not to persuade or induce her sister to marry the suitor who had formerly addressed her unless she could return his affection whomsoever she married her fortune should be my care doubtless in a little time some one would be to her as dear as i once had fancied myself to be let i said no disparity in fortune then be an obstacle on either side i will cheerfully give up half my own to redeem whatever affliction i may have occasioned her with this letter i entirely satisfied my conscience it is almost incredible to think in how short a time the whole of these events had been crowded within a few weeks i had concentrated the whole history of love its first mysterious sentiment its ardent passion its dissension its coolness its breach its everlasting farewell in four days i received a letter from julia's sister none from julia it was written in a tone of pert and flippant insolence which made me more than ever reconciled to the turn of events but it contained one piece of news i did not hear with indifference julia had accepted the offer of her former suitor and was to be married next week she bids me say wrote the widow that she sees at once through your pretence under an affected wish for her happiness to prevent her forming this respectable connection she sees that you still assume the right to dictate to her and that your offers of generosity are merely the condescensions of a fancied superiority she assures you however that your wish for her happiness is already realized this undeserved and insulting message completed my conquest over any lurking remorse or regret and i did not in my resentment at julia's injustice perceive how much it was the operation of a wounded vanity upon a despairing heart i still lingered in town and some days afterward i went to dine in the neighbourhood of westminster at the house of one of the most jovial boon companions i had for some weeks avoided society the temporary cessation gave a new edge to my zest for its pleasures the hours flew rapidly my spirits rose and i enjoyed the present with a gust that had been long denied to me on leaving the house on foot the fineness of the night with its frosty air and clear stars tempted me to turn from my direct way homeward and i wandered mechanically toward a scene which has always possessed me at night a great attraction viz the bridge which divides the suburb from the very focus of the capital with its proud abbey and gloomy centre i walked to and from the bridge gazing at times on the dark waters reflecting the lights from the half-seen houses and the stars of the solemn heavens my mind was filled with shadowy and vague presentiments i felt awed and saddened without a palpable cause the late excitement of my spirits was succeeded by a melancholy reaction i mused over the various disappointments of my life and the ixion like delusion with which i had so often wooed a deity and clasped a cloud my history with julia made a principal part of these meditations her image turned to me irresistibly and with renewed charms in vain i endeavoured to recur to the feelings of self-acquittal and gratulations 
which a few hours ago had actuated me my heart was softened and my memory refused to recall all harsher retrospection her love her innocence only obtruded themselves upon me and i sighed to think that perhaps by this time she was irrevocably another's i retraced my steps and was now at the end of the bridge when just by the stairs i perceived a crowd and heard a vague and gathering clamour a secret impulse hurried me to the place i heard a policeman speaking with the eagerness which characterises the excitement of narration my suspicions were aroused quoth he as i passed and saw a female standing by the bridge so you see i kept loitering there and a minute after i went gently up and i heard the young woman groan and she turned round as i came up for i frightened her and i never shall forget her face it was so woe-begone and yet she was so young and handsome and so you see i spoke to her and i said says i young woman what do you hear at this hour and she said i am waiting for a boat i expect my mother from richmond and somehow or other i was foolish enough to believe what she said she looked so quiet and respectable like and i went away you understand and in about a minute after for i kept near the spot i heard a heavy splash in the water and then i knew what it all was i ran up and just saw her once rise and so as i could not swim i gave the alarm and we got the boat but it was too late poor girl lisp an old coster woman i dare say she was crossed in love what is this said i mixing with the crowd a young woman as has drowned herself sir where i do not see the body it be taken to the watch house and the doctors are trying to recover it a horrible idea had crossed my mind unfounded improbable as it seemed i felt as if compelled to confirm or remove it i made the policeman go with me to the watch-house i pushed away the crowd i approached the body oh god that white face the heavy dripping hair the swollen form and all that decent and maiden beauty with the coarse cover half thrown over it and the unsympathizing surgeons standing by and the unfamiliar faces of the women what a scene what a deathbed julia julia thou art avenged it was her then whom i beheld her the victim the self-destroyer i hurry over the awful record i am writing my own condemnation stamping my own curse they found upon the corpse a letter drenched as it was i yet could decipher its characters it was to me it ran thus i believe now that i have been much to blame for i am writing calmly with a fixed determination not to live and i see how much i have thrown away the love you once gave me yet i have loved you always how dearly i never told you and never can tell but when you seem to think so much of your what shall i say your condescension in marrying perhaps loving me it maddened me to the brain and though i would have given worlds to please you i could not bear to see the difference in your manner after you came to see me daily and to think of me as a woman ought to be thought of and this i know made me seem cross and peevish and unamiable but i could not help it and so you ceased to love me and i felt that and longed madly to release you from a tie you repented the moment came for me to do so and we parted then you wrote to me and my sister made me see in the letter what perhaps you did not intend but indeed i was only sensible to the thought that i had lost you for ever and that you scorned me and then my vanity was roused and i 
knew you still loved me and i fancied i could revenge myself upon you by marrying another but when i came to see and meet and smile upon that other and to feel the day approach and to reflect that you had been all in all to me and that i was about to pass my whole life with one i loathed after having loved so well and so entirely i felt i had reckoned too much on my own strength and that i could not sustain my courage any longer nothing is left to me in life the anguish i suffer is intolerable and i have at length made up my mind to die but think not i am a poor lovesick girl only i am more i am still a revengeful woman you have deserted me and i know myself to blame but i cannot bear that you should forget and despise me as you would if i were to marry i am about to force you to remember me for ever to be sorry for me to forgive me to love me better than you have done yet even when you loved me most it is in this that i shall be revenged and with this wild turmoil of contending feelings the pride of womanhood wrestling with the softness forgiveness with revenge high emotions with erring principles agony led on to death by one hope to be remembered and deplored with this contest at thy heart didst thou go down to thy watery grave what must have passed within thee in those brief and terrible moments when thou stoodest by the dark waters hesitating lingering fearing yet resolved and i was near thee in that hour and knew thee not at hand and saved not o oh, bitter was the revenge lasting is the remembrance henceforth i ask no more of human affections i stand alone on the earth End of section three. Section four of the Rover, volume one, number eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the rover volume one number eight edited by seba smith and lawrence labrie section four the tournament rosalie beneath thy gaze my young heart's pulse has bounded rosalie to sing thy praise my wild harp's strings have sounded i've proved myself thine own true knight at barrier and in bower by every token that beseems a gallant troubadour then say may such devoirs pretend to love so hot as thine say rosalie my lady love oh say wilt thou be mine the singer was a young man of noble and commanding appearance who cased in complete armour and mounted on a barbary steed which seemed to have borne its rider many a weary league was slowly yet evidently with the jaded animal's utmost speed pursuing his road to moulin it was one of those inclement autumn evenings which intimate the near approach of winter the sun was setting in sullen majesty and the frequent hollow gusts of wind that swept from the trees which lined the road with their sere and yellow foliage foretold the gloom of the coming night was about to be deepened by an impending storm and entirely absorbed by his reflections the traveller scarce heeded the threatening aspect of the sky till aroused from the reverie by a loud and reverberating peal of thunder succeeded by a deluging rain hastily seeking the shelter of some chestnut trees that arched the roads he patiently waited till the storm should exhaust its rage lo lie your glories now ye scattered emblems of human life mused he as the withered leaves at every gust of wind fell around him in an almost overwhelming shower ye whisper forth a tale of faded hopes and blighted joys that might well repress the tumultuous throb of the young and ardent bosom 
not long ago ye were smiling in the bloom of luxuriant vigour and beauty foretelling but little of the sickening change the worm and the canker that were so soon to rot on your verdure and then perchance the hopes that long have flourished in my own breast are doomed to a speedy decay thus the fair prospect that fancy has decked out with brightest hues may be ere long or clouded by the blight of an untimely winter rosalie may be another's the storm was of short duration the moon broke from behind the deep lowering clouds that had before obscured her fair face and the traveller pursued his journey coming at length to a spot where two roads met and ignorant which to follow he determined to take up his abode for the night at the first cottage he might chance to discover his search was not long fruitless he presently observed a dwelling at a distance which on a nearer approach proved by the cross before the door to be the cell of an anchorite the door was opened by the venerable inhabitant of the retreat who received the stranger courteously and prepared a simple but plenteous meal to which he pressed him with the utmost cordiality and though his portion was but scant he gave it with good will as the anchorite busied himself in performing the rites of hospitality our traveller had leisure to observe him from more narrowly his silvery locks and snowy beard imparted to his singularly handsome features a venerable and impressive air yet the undiminished glances of his bright hazel eye and his tall and bending form told that the hand of sorrow rather than the weight of years had sprinkled its untimely frost upon his brow the furniture of the simple apartment was as singular as its owner various astronomical and scientific instruments whose uses were then little known in europe with an hour-glass and water-dial lay scattered about and appended to the wall were several wallets and flasks containing medicaments and preparations of the healing art which the traveller readily perceived was practised by the anchorite less as a profession than as a charitable exercise the stranger was not a little surprised to find his frugal meal flanked with a flagon of burgundy i taste not myself the juice of grapes said the solitary in reply to his guest's commendations of the generous beverage i taste it not myself but reserve it for travellers who like the honour with a visit my humble cell i have of late experienced no lack of guests for many a gay chevalier has within these few days vouchsafed to enter my lowly porch on his way to the tournament where i trow thou art wending the stranger replied in the negative professing his ignorance of any such meeting is it possible added the solitary that thou hast heard naught of the gay doings at the castle of nevers i have been journeying from a distant province father said the young man but may i ask the cause of these merry-makings nothing less rejoined the anchorite than to honour the approaching nuptials of the count's fair niece rosalie st clair st mary ejaculated the youth to whom is the maiden betrothed to the chevalier de rosny replied the solitary with a deep sigh de rosny by st michael it must not be cried the stranger thou sayest well young man it must not be replied the solitary adding in a solemn tone the fates oppose it justice forbids it to rosny's nuptial couch shall be the bloody beer give me thy hand father cried the youth if thou art a foe to the base to rosny thou art indeed my friend but who art thou my son and what hast thou to do with that false knight that traitest to rosny my venerable friend replied the stranger would i could answer thy inquiry who i am is wrapped in mystery what i am alas is too apparent mine father is a wayward lot i never knew a parent's fostering care i never whispered to a mother's tender ear my joys and sorrows i am a nameless orphan a foundling my earliest recollection carries me to a magnificent chateau where i was nurtured in the lap of splendour beneath the eye of some indulgent friend but of his rank or his kindred if any to myself my memory retains no record anon a fearful change awaited me my kind protector died or perchance deserted me but father thou art unwell exclaimed the youth abruptly terminating his narrative as he beheld the anchorite trembling with ill-suppressed emotion it's nothing a momentary pang proceed with thy tale what more of thy protector poor child in losing him thou wert indeed deserted 
my kind friend left me continued the stranger and with him perished the only happiness i ever knew i was shortly after removed from the chateau and consigned to the care of some stern guardian from whom i experienced nothing but severity i might perhaps have numbered ten summers when i was removed from this comfortless asylum and became an inmate of the chateau de rosny but oh never to my dying hour can i forget the harsh contemptuous treatment which i received from the chevalier the domestics imitated their lord in cruelty to the poor friendless orphan and bitter in truth was my lot i was considered the child of a deceased friend of de rosny and often did i marvel that my father left not his cold grave to reproach my tyrant with inhumanity toward his defenceless boy as i approached to man's estate the contumelies of de rosny daily became more galling at length disgusted with his haughty and contemptuous bearing i left him and in the castle of the count of nevers i sought and found a home my services and arms attracted that gallant nobleman's notice who created me his esquire and honoured me with his especial regard but still my evil destiny pursued me in my attendance on the count i could not fail full often to enjoy the society of his niece and heiress rosalie st clair my presumptuous heart dared to love the noble lady and her bosom did not disdain my homage our intercourse was discovered to the count by an emissary of de rosny who still beheld me with an eye of hatred and watched occasion to undo me i was disgraced and forfeited the protection of my noble master driven from the home that long had sheltered me i joined as a volunteer the arms of our monarch in normandy during a long time of warfare i won my road to renown and from the royal hands of st louis i at length received the honour of knighthood the escutcheon of henri of the arrow mounted at the king's command the ennobling chevron and i stand forth the first of my race prepared to prove by deeds of arm my title to nobility what saidst thou was thy name asked the old man henri of the arrow replied the knight i am so named from a mark on my arm let me see it cried the solitary in breathless agitation the youth bared his arm and discovered the mark alluded to god of heaven thy ways though inscrutable are just cried the old man brave youth thou art of no ignoble race i knew thy father i knew thy sainted mother thou art hold my rash heart added he checking himself what tell me what i am exclaimed the youth sinking on his knees thou art what thy future bearing shall prove thee replied the old man recovering his calmness and adding thy destiny is in thy own hands early to-morrow thou shalt high to the tournament and against to rosny enter the lists manfully acquit thyself and a declaration of thy rights and restoration to thy father's arms shall be thy reward seek not to know more added he as the youth was about to interrogate him let us address ourselves to that being who avenges on the head of the oppressor the wrongs of the fatherless and then to our pallets for i promise thee de rosny will prove no mean antagonist thou wilt need rest to recruit thy exhausted powers ere thou enter the lists with him with daybreak henri arose from his sleepless couch and prepared for his journey to nevers ere his departure the anchorite knelt with him and implored divine assistance on his hazardous enterprise then invoking a fervent benediction on his head bade him adieu go forth and conquer my son said he acquit thyself manfully and heaven protect the righteous cause scarcely allowing himself to reflect on the strange adventure he had witnessed henri spurred his courser briskly forward and leaving the open country gained the road to moulin first however having met a peasant he had taken occasion to learn somewhat of the hermit with whom he had sojourned monsieur would ask if i know the venerable father clement replied the man in truth i know him and may the blessed saints reward his goodness he is the guardian angel of our hamlet who but father clement visits us in sickness and counsels us in health who but he instructs our children and directs us in our affairs our neighbours deem him a wizard because forsooth he possesses knowledge for which simple cottagers cannot account but we who know him more intimately and are benefited by his assistance know him to be familiar with no other spirit than the pure spirit of charity as the peasant's account had little effect in clearing the mystery that enveloped father clement 
henri bade him good day and continued his route from Belin, our traveller proceeded through the country whose picturesque and romantic scenery once familiar to his eyes recalled to his memory the happy days he had spent in the service of count de nevers and filled his bosom with sad yet delightful sensations not a forest reared itself in magnificent grandeur before him in which he had not once hunted the bristly sanglier not a hillock presented itself on the bright landscape which did not awake some pleasing reminiscence at intervals the broad bosom of the loire burst upon the view brightened by the beams of the morning sun to a sheet of liquid gold the winged songsters that flitted among the tall trees bordering the road filled the air with their melody a thousand wild flowers flung round their wilderness of sweets and the hedges composed of various fruit trees intertwined with maple and festooned with vines offered their choicest products in tempting profusion to the traveller leaving henri in his journey through these enchanting scenes we will with the reader's permission transport him in nevers which was now the rendezvous of all the chivalry of the province belted knights and barons bold striplings gay and warriors old and ladies decked in jewelled guise their richest gems their own bright eyes it was the last day of the tournament and was attended by the unusual assemblage of all the bright and brave the chevalier de rosny who in his various encounters had carried off the prize against all competitors had issued his defiance of all arrived at the dignity of knighthood to meet him at tilt tourney or barrier from an early hour crowds of spectators were thronging the appointed spot which was an extensive plain immediately below the town the view from the lists were of the most delightful description an extensive range of hills formed an amphitheatre around it to the right appeared the town of nevers pleasantly situated on the declivity of a hill and crowned by the majestic chateau of the count at the foot of the town flowed the loire with galleys splendidly adorned whose streamers floated gaily in the morning air at midday a flourish of clarions announced the approach of the count who with the ladies of his family and a numerous retinue arrived and took possession of the splendid marquis prepared for his reception the heralds sounded to the combat and to rosny armed at a, all points and mounted on a charger splendidly caparisoned entered the list and bowed to the spectators who received him with acclamations the chevalier was a man of gigantic stature apparently past the meridian of life the traces of violent passions and of a haughty imperious temper were observable on his strong marked countenance and as his eye glanced in proud triumph toward his intended bride it spoke little of that chivalrous devotion which distinguished the chevaliers of the day it rather seemed to intimate a consciousness that rosalie could not but seem delighted with the love he gave no such expression was however perceptible on the pale features of rosalie whose young and lovely form offered a striking contrast to that of her destined lord arrayed in smiles that ill agreed with her wounded feelings the maiden occupied as mistress of the ceremonies the centre of a throng of fair and noble dames again the clarion's blast thrilled the air and the herald pronounced to rosny's challenge once twice and thrice at the intervals of several minutes the trumpet sounded and still no answer was returned none except the challenge exclaimed the heralds to rosny threw himself from his steed and advancing to rosalie claimed from her fair hands the victor's meed rosalie trembled as she gazed on her future husband yet as her tearful eye caught the angry glance of her uncle she repressed her emotion and with quivering lip congratulated the chevalier already was her hand extended to place upon his brow the wreath of triumph when a stir was perceived among the crowd and the words a defiance a defiance burst from a thousand lips mounted on a foaming barbary steed a knight pressed through the throng and cleared the barrier at a leap entered the lists his polished steel armour totally devoid of ornament dazzled the eye of the beholder and the white plume that danced above his close beaver nodded in proud defiance his shield bore a chevron in grailed charged with a radiated star and surmounted by the motto connu par se rayon as he entered the list de rosny's herald once more proclaimed the challenge alone and unattended cried the strange knight i bring my own reply thy challenge i accept sir knight and by the aid of god of st michael and st george will prove myself not unworthy of the spurs i wear hadst thou not best recruit thy own 
and thy good steeds exhausted strength sir knight demanded de rosny advancing toward the stranger i lack no rest replied he and my steed will recover himself while the conditions are being settled he is used to the service and recks little of the few leagues he has carried me this morning thou hast then travelled far to meet me in the lists and dost reject my courtesy may i ask the name of my antagonist and if we meet as friends look at my escutcheon sir knight and read my answer there if success attend me in the tournament thou wilt know too soon if not content thyself with knowing thou hast vanquished one who never before knew defeat the signal for the encounter broke off further converse and the combatants took their stations assigned them de rosny began the tilt with more than his usual address compelling his antagonist to remain on the defensive the stranger however proved himself an adept in the use of the lance defending himself with consummate skill against the herculean strength of de rosny at length the chevalier's impetuosity proved fatal to his success eager to terminate the combat he sprung violently forward but the stranger keeping his lance at rest received him with coolness and precision and de rosny's lance shivering into a thousand pieces he was unhorsed and fell with stunning violence to the ground roused from his stupor by the shouts that hailed his defeat he sprung from the ground and drawing his sword prepared to retrieve his ill fortune still however the stranger's coolness and address proved superior and after a desperate combat de rosny was disarmed and his antagonist declared the victor overcome with shame and disgrace the chevalier refused the consolation offered him by his disappointed friends and was retiring from the lists when his attention was arrested by an unexpected circumstance the strange knight had been summoned to receive the reward of his victory from the hands of rosalie st clair as he knelt before her he unclasped his beaver and discovered the well-known features of henri of the arrow henri exclaimed the fond girl too deeply agitated to repress her tumultuous feelings she arose and was clasped weeping to the bosom of her lover unhand her villain shouted de rosny as he attempted to tear her from his arms away she is no longer thine replied the youth she has found a valued friend as thou false knight are a determined foe insolent thinkest thou that noble maid can bestow her regards on thee vile peasant as thou art equally beneath her love and my revenge yet dread my fury and retire thou wretch without a name if such ye be what but thy crimes have made him so exclaimed a voice from behind and at the same instant the white locks of father clement were seen floating in the air de rosny continued the old man vengeance has overtaken thee he whom thou didst supplant has brought thee to dishonour the nameless boy thou long hast scorned has lived to repay thy many contumelies that nameless boy is here to claim his rights to declare and to maintain to the rank which thou hast long usurped before this noble assembly i proclaim this foundling to be the heir of the chevalier albert de rosny who perished in the holy land the elder and injured brother of yon recreant knight gaze on him noble de Vers, continued the anchorite taking henri's hand and leading him to the feet of the count to examine well his features dost thou not discover the lineament the form of thy once loved albert and look upon yon cowering traitor do not his quivering limbs his haggard countenance betray his guilt to rosny said the count i call on thee as a true knight to rebut a charge that so immediately affects thy honour is it possible the noble de nevers can give heed to the wild raving of a maniac replied the chevalier whose agitation was visible notwithstanding his affected indifference because forsooth a drivelling dotard wills to vent on me the monstrous conception of his disordered brain am i to be adjudged guilty of the darkest deeds and without proof or trial both proof and trial de rosny thou shalt have said the count and if thy accuser be found to have trifled with thy reputation not even his hoary lock shall save him from condign punishment wisely and justly said de nevers added the anchorite now hear the charge i bring against the false knight when albert de rosny departed for palestine he confided to his brother's charge his infant heir that faithless guardian determined to supplant the child and having surrounded with his emissaries his unsuspecting brother for the purpose of preventing his return should he survive the perils of warfare he assumed to himself the title and estates albert 
escaped the hands of the infidels and was according to his brother's instructions attracted to a lonely defile and left to perish the child from whom nothing could be apprehended was permitted to live and after having remained some time in privacy was received an inmate of the chateau as a protege of the chevaliers driven from his home by the many contumelies of derosny and he sought thy protection noble de nevers thyself knowest how faithfully he served thee subsequently he fought beneath the banners of the royal louis with what honour the charges on his escutcheon may show he now stands forth prepared to maintain in combat his title to the rank and estates of the deceased albert de rosny as the anchorite concluded henri advanced to the centre of the lists and throwing down his gauntlet repeated the defiance which was accepted by de rosny and the following morning was appointed for the combat on the spot where before they had encountered in the bloodless exercise of the tournament the combatants met in mortal affray they fought with short swords in the use of which they displayed an equality of skill that long rendered the combat dubious at length a well-directed thrust pierced the mail of the chevalier who sunk mortally wounded to the ground a grim smile of defiance lit upon the features of the dying chevalier as he gazed on his youthful victor and on his entreaties that he would lighten his conscience by a confession replied thou hast conquered let it content thee thou wilt not confess thy guilt cried his antagonist raising his weapon nay think not boy to scare me to confession thee and thy threats alike i hold in scorn replied de rosny with a laugh that thrilled the spectators with horror enough exclaimed the count de nevers the god of battles has upheld the righteous cause but say mysterious being he added addressing the anchorite how didst thou gain intelligence of de rosny's treachery of young henri's wrongs de nevers replied the old man how is the midnight murderer brought to punishment how is the wretch that robbed the fatherless after a long and triumphant course of undetected crime dragged forth to light with all his infamy upon him there is an overruling providence that avenges on the guilty head the deeds of darkness there is an eye that can discover the most secret guilt that rests not till it has wreaked terrible retribution on the oppressor let me ease the dying wretch's conscience of at least one pang continued he as he approached the prostrate chevalier de rosny cried he continue not thus obdurate confess thyself to god in whose presence thou wilt shortly be and let me lighten thy bosom of its heaviest load thy brother perish not by the hands of thy emissaries thou art not albert's murderer the chevalier seemed roused from his stupor by the words yet it was but to evince his impenitence not albert's murderer he faintly yet sternly ejaculated who dared to mock me thus i tell thee albert perished at joppa i i commanded the deed and alain bertellier struck him to the heart eustace die not with that terrible impression brood not with that horrid delight upon a deed of guilt that will sink thee deeper in perdition while thou hast time repent and spare thyself the pang the guilt of albert's destruction he yet lives and implores thee to regard thy eternal welfare ha ah, lives yes yes he has escaped me and thou thou art he his dying hand grasped convulsively his sword which it had not once relinquished he strove to raise himself but with a deep groan sank back and immediately expired as soon as the count de nevers could recover from the agitation by which he had been thrown by the harrowing scene he addressed the anchorite what am i to understand my venerable friend said he from the last expression of that impenitent wretch had his perception deceived him or do i indeed address your friend albert de rosny interrupted the anchorite grasping the hand of the count yes added he with grief and horror i acknowledge that wretch my relative but with pride with joy i confess myself the father of that noble boy come to my arms my henri he exclaimed rushing toward the youth thy father's heart has long throbbed to feel thine beat upon it it will no longer hold my father oh i am too happy cried henri sinking at the feet of his venerable parent forgive me my dear count said the elder de rosny when his agitation allowed him utterance for having so long worn the mask before thee resolved to prove my boy worthy his illustrious ancestry before i acknowledged him i conceal myself from even him informing him of nothing farther than was necessary to accomplish my designs believe me my dear chevalier replied the count warmly returning his friend's embrace i cannot give expression to the delight with which 
i hail a long lost loved and long lamented friend but wherefore didst thou not before assert thy rights it is a long and melancholy tale de nevers of which i can at present give thee but a rude outline left for dead by my brother's emissaries i had strength of remaining to crawl to an adjacent habitation the inmates received me and by skilful treatment i recovered from my wounds and was without ransom set at liberty the expedition had left palestine when i was pronounced convalescent after a tedious journey i arrived in france enfeebled in mind and body by suffering and fatigue judge my feelings at discovering my inhuman brother possessed of my title and in states and my poor child despoiled of his rights removed to some place of secrecy perhaps murdered by his treacherous guardian fearing however that a declaration of his rights might urge my brother to cruelty toward my boy if yet he lived i retired without making myself known and occupied as a solitary anchorite a retreat near moulins a life of seclusion and austerity weaned me from the world and ere long i ceased to consider my brother's injury a detriment to my own happiness my poor boy i doubted not had perished and i left the punishment of his barbarous uncle to the hand of him who has declared vengeance is mine that vengeance has at length reached him three days since my henri visited by chance my humble cell i discovered in him my long-lost boy yet resolving that himself should win his honours i continued unknown to him thyself count knowest the rest and will not scorn the heartfelt warmth with which a father thanks thy kindness to his friendless boy i merit not thy thanks as yet my dear de rosny replied the count let me first proclaim to this assembly the restoration of thy rights nay de nevers do honour to my henri if thou wilt as for me i am too old to bear the burden i have so long been a stranger to the anchorite cell must still be my home the count took the hand of henri and leading him forward proclaimed him the lawful possessor of the title so long usurped by the deceased the declaration was received with enthusiasm and the cry of long live the valiant chevalier de rosny burst from the lips of the multitude the reader will be prepared to learn that ere long the fair rosalie was united to the lover of her choice who long continued to wear his dignity with honour to himself and advantage to his master the gallant louis the seventh who had honoured his nuptials with his presence and ever remained the firm friend of the knight of the chevron end of section four section five of the rover volume one number eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the rover volume one number eight edited by seba smith and lawrence labrie section five the sexton of cologne in the year fifteen seventy one there lived at cologne a rich burgomaster whose wife adelaide then in the prime of her youth and beauty fell sick and died they had lived very happily together and throughout her fatal illness the doting husband scarcely quitted her bedside for an instant during the latter period of her sickness she did not suffer greatly but the fainting fits grew more and more frequent and of increasing duration till at length they became incessant and she finally sank under them it is well known that cologne is a city which as far as respects religion may compare itself with rome on which account it was called even in the middle ages roma germanica and sometimes the sacred city it seemed as if in after times it wished to compensate by piety the misfortune of having been the birthplace of the abominable agrippina for many years nothing else was seen but priests students and mendicant monks while the bells were ringing and tolling from morning till night even now you may count in it as many churches and cloisters as the year has days the principal church is the cathedral of st peter one of the handsomest buildings in all germany though still not so complete it was probably intended by the architect the choir alone is arched 
the chief altar is a single block of black marble brought along the rhine to cologne from namur upon the moss in the sacristy an ivory rod is shown said to have belonged to the apostle peter and in a chapel stands a gilded coffin with the names of the holy three kings inscribed their skulls are visible through an opening two being white as belonging to caspar and balthazar the third black for melchior it was in this church that adelaide was buried with great splendour in the spirit of that age which had more feeling for the solid than real taste more devotion and confidence than unbelieving fear she was dressed as a bride in flowered silk a motley garland upon her head and her pale fingers covered with costly rings in which state she was conveyed to the vault of a little chapel directly under the choir in a coffin with glass windows many of her forefathers were already resting here all embalmed and with their mummy forms offered a strange contrast to the silver and gold with which they were decorated and teaching in a peculiar fashion the difference between the perishable and the imperishable the custom of embalming was in the present instance given up and when adelaide was buried it was settled that no one else should be laid there for the future with a heavy heart had adolf followed his wife to her final resting-place the turret bells of two hundred and twenty hundredweight lifted up their deep voices and spread the sounds of mourning through the wide city while the monks carrying tapers and scattering incense sang requiems from their huge vellum folios which were spread upon the music desks in the choir but the service was now over the dead lay alone with the dead the immense clock which is only wound up once a year and shows the course of the planets as well as the hours of the day was the only thing that had sound or motion in the whole cathedral its monotonous ticking seemed to mock the silent grave it was a stormy november evening when petier bolt the sexton of st peter's was returning home after this splendid funeral the poor man who had been married four years had one child a daughter which his wife brought him in the second year of their marriage and was again expecting her confinement it was therefore with a heavy heart that he had left the church for his cottage which lay damp and cold on the banks of a river and which at this dull season looked more gloomy than ever at the door he was met by the little maria who called out with great delight you must not go upstairs father the stork has been here and brought maria a little brother a piece of information more expected than agreeable and which was soon after confirmed by the appearance of his sister-in-law with a healthy infant in her arms his wife however had suffered much and was in a state that required assistance far beyond his means to supply in this distress he bethought himself of the old jew isaac who had lately advanced him a trifle on his old silver watch but now unfortunately he had nothing more to pledge and was forced to ground all his hopes on the jew's compassion a very unsafe anchorage with doubtful steps he sought the house of the miser and told his tale amid tears and sighs to all of which isaac listened with great patience so much so that bolt began to flatter himself with a favourable answer to his petition but he was disappointed the jew having heard him out coolly replied that he could lend no monies on a child it was no good pledge with bitter execrations on the usurer's hard-heartedness poor bolt rushed from his door when to aggravate his situation the first snow of the season began to fall and that so thick and fast that in a very short time the housetops presented a single field of white immersed in his grief he missed his way across the market-place 
and when he least expected such a thing found himself in the front of the cathedral the great clock chimed three quarters he had wanted then a quarter to twelve where was he to look for assistance at such an hour or indeed at any hour he had already applied to the rich prelates and got from them all that their charity was likely to give suddenly a thought struck him like lightning he saw his little maria crying for the food he could not give her his sick wife lying in bed with the infant on her exhausted bosom and then adelaide in her splendid coffin and her hand glittering with jewels it could not grasp of what use are diamonds to her now said he to himself is there any sin in robbing the dead to give to the living i would not do such a thing for myself if i were starving no heaven forbid but for my wife and child ah that's quite another matter quieting his conscience as well as he could with this opiate he hurried home to get the necessary implements but by the time he reached his own door his resolution began to waver the sight however of his wife's distress brought him up again to the sticking-place and having provided himself with a dark lantern the church keys and a crow to break open the coffin he set out for the cathedral on the way all manner of strange fancies crossed him the earth seemed to shake beneath him it was the tottering of his own limbs a figure seemed to sign him back it was the shade thrown from some column that waved to and fro as the lamplight flickered in the night wind but still the thought of home drove him on and even the badness of the weather carried this consolation with it he was the more likely to find the streets clear and escape detection he had now reached the cathedral for a moment he paused on the steps and then taking heart put the huge key into the lock to his fancy it had never opened with such readiness before the bolt shot back at the light touch of the key and he stood alone in the church trembling from head to foot still it was requisite to close the door behind him lest its being opened should be noticed by any one passing by and give rise to suspicion and as he did so the story came across his mind of the man who visited a church at midnight to show his courage for a sign that he had really been there he was to stick his knife into a coffin but in his hurry and trepidation he struck it through the skirt of his coat without being aware of it and supposing himself held back by some supernatural agency dropped down dead from terror full of these unpleasant recollections he tottered up the nave and as the light successively flashed upon the sculptured marbles it seemed as if the pale figures frowned ominously upon him but desperation supplied the place of courage he kept on his way to the choir descended the steps passed through the long narrow passage with the dead heaped on either side opened adelaide's chapel and stood at once before her coffin there she lay stiff and pale the wreath in her hair and the jewels on her fingers gleaming strangely in the dim light of the lantern he even fancied that he already smelt a pestilential breath of decay though it was full early for corruption to have begun his work a sickness seized him at the thought and he leaned for support against one of the columns with his eyes fixed on the coffin when was it real or was it illusion a change came over the face of the dead he started back and that change so indescribable had passed away in an instant leaving a darker shadow on the features if i had only time he said to himself if i had only time i would rather break open one of the other coffins and leave the lady adelaide in quiet age has destroyed all that is human in these mummies they have lost that resemblance to life which makes the dead so terrible and i should no more mind handling them than so many dry bones it's all nonsense though one is as harmless as the other and since the lady adelaide's house is the easiest for my work i must e'en set about it but the coffin did not offer the facilities he reckoned upon with so much certainty the glass windows were secured inwardly 
with iron wire leaving no space for the admission of the hand so that he found himself obliged to break the lid to pieces a task that with his imperfect implements cost both time and labour as the wood splintered and cracked under the heavy blows of the iron the cold perspiration poured in streams down his face the sound assuring him more than all the rest that he was committing sacrilege before it was only the place with its dark associations that had terrified him now he began to be afraid of himself and would without doubt have given up the business altogether if the lid had not suddenly flown to pieces alarmed at his very success he started round as if expecting to see some one behind watching his sacrilege and ready to clutch him and so strong had been the illusion that when he found this was not the case he fell upon his knees before the coffin exclaiming forgive me dear lady if i take from you what is of no use to yourself while a single diamond will make a poor family so happy it is not for myself oh no it is for my wife and children he thought the dead looked more kindly at him as he spoke thus and certainly the livid shadow had passed away from her face without more delay he raised the cold hand to draw the rings from its finger but what was his horror when the dead returned his grasp his hand was clutched ay firmly clutched though that rigid face and form lay there as motionless as ever with a cry of horror he burst away not retaining so much presence of mind as to think of the light which he left burning by the coffin this however was of little consequence fear can find its way in the dark and he rushed through the vaulted passage up the steps through the choir and would have found his way out had he not in his hurry forgotten the stone called the devil's stone which lies in the middle of the church and which according to the legend was cast there by the devil thus much is certain it has fallen from the arch and they still show a hole above through which it is said to have been hurled against this stone the unlucky sexton stumbled just as the clock struck twelve and immediately he fell to the earth in a death-like swoon the cold however soon brought him to himself and on recovering his senses he again fled winged by terror and fully convinced that he had no hope of escaping the vengeance of the dead except by the confession of his crime and gaining the forgiveness of her family with this view he hurried across the market-place to the burgomaster's house where he had to knock long before he could attract any notice the whole household lay in a profound sleep with the exception of the unhappy adolph who was sitting alone on the same sofa where he had so often sat with his adelaide her picture hung on the wall opposite to him though it might be said rather to feed his grief than to afford him any consolation and yet as most would do under such circumstances he dwelt upon it the more intently even from the pain it gave him and it was not till the sexton had knocked repeatedly that he awoke from his melancholy dreams roused at last he opened the window and inquired who it was that disturbed him at such an unseasonable hour it is only i mr burgomaster was the answer and who are you again asked adolph bolt the sexton of st peter's mr burgomaster i have a thing of the utmost importance to discover to you naturally associating the idea of adelaide with the sexton of the church where she was buried adolph was immediately anxious to know something more of the matter and taking up a wax light he hastened downstairs and himself opened the door to bolt what have you to say to me he exclaimed not here mr burgomaster replied the anxious sexton not here we may be overheard adolph though wondering at this affectation of mystery motioned him in and closed the door when bolt throwing himself at his feet confessed all that had happened the anger of adolph was mixed with compassion as he listened to the strange recital nor could he refuse to bolt the absolution which the poor fellow deemed so essential to his security from the vengeance of the dead at the same time he cautioned him to maintain a profound silence on the subject toward every one else as otherwise the sacrilege might be attended with serious consequences it not being likely that the ecclesiastics 
to whom the judgment of such matters belonged would view his fault with equal indulgence he even resolved to go himself to the church with bolt that he might investigate the affair more thoroughly but to this proposition the sexton gave a prompt and positive denial i would rather he exclaimed i would rather be dragged to the scaffold than again disturb the repose of the dead this declaration so ill-timed confounded adolphe on the one hand he felt an undefined curiosity to look more narrowly into this mysterious business on the other he could not help feeling compassion for the sexton who it was evident was labouring under the influence of a delusion which he was utterly unable to subdue the poor fellow trembled all over as if shaken by an ague fit and painted the situation of his wife and his pressing poverty with such a pale face and such despair in his eyes that he might himself have passed for a churchyard spectre the burgomaster again admonished him to be silent for fear of the consequences and giving him a couple of dollars to relieve his immediate wants sent him home to his wife and family being thus deprived of his most natural ally on this occasion adolph summoned an old and confidential servant of whose secrecy he could have no doubt to his question of do you fear the dead hans stoutly replied they are not half so dangerous as the living indeed said the burgomaster do you think then that you have courage enough to go into the church at night in the way of my duty yes replied hans not otherwise it is not right to trifle with holy matters do you believe in ghosts hans continued adolph yes mr burgomaster do you fear them no mr burgomaster i hold by god and he holds me up and god is the strongest will you go with me to the cathedral hans i have had a strange dream to-night it seemed to me as if my deceased wife called to me from the steeple window i see how it is answered hans the sexton has been with you and put this whim into your head mr burgomaster these gravediggers are always seeing ghosts put a light into your lantern said adolph avoiding a direct reply to this observation of the old man be silent and follow me if you bid me said hans i must of course obey for you are my magistrate as well as my master herewith he lit the candle in the lantern and followed his master without further opposition adolph hurried into the church with hasty steps but the old man who went before him to show the way delayed him with his reflections so that their progress was but slow even at the threshold he stopped and flung the light of his lantern upon the gilded rods over the door to which it is accustomed to add a fresh one every year that people may know how long the reigning elector has lived that is an excellent custom said hans one has only to count those staves and one learns immediately how long the gracious elector has governed us simple men not a monument would he pass without first stopping to examine it by the lantern light and requesting the burgomaster to explain its inscription although he had spent his three and sixty years in cologne and during that period had been in the habit of frequenting it almost daily adolph who well knew that no representations would avail him submitted patiently to the humours of his old servant contenting himself with answering his questions as briefly as possible and in this way they at last got to the high altar here hans made a sudden stop and was not to be brought any farther quick exclaimed the burgomaster who was beginning to lose his patience for his heart throbbed with expectation heaven and all good angels defend us murmured hans through his chattering teeth while he in vain felt for his rosary which yet hung as usual at his girdle what is the matter now cried adolph do you see who sits there replied hans where exclaimed his master i see nothing hold up the lantern heaven shield us cried the old man there sits our deceased lady on the altar in a long white veil and drinks out of the sacramental cup with a trembling had he held up the lantern in the direction to which he pointed it was indeed as he had said there she sat with the paleness of death upon her face her white garments waving heavily in the night wind that rushed through the aisles of the church and holding the silver goblet to her lips with long bony arms wasted by protracted illness even adolph's courage began to waver adelaide he cried 
i conjure you in the name of the blessed trinity answer me is in thy living self or but thy shadow ah replied a faint voice you buried me alive and but for this wine i had perished from exhaustion come up to me dear adolph i am no shadow but i shall soon be with shadows unless i receive your speedy succour go not near her said hans it is the evil one that has assumed the blessed shape of my lady to destroy you away old man exclaimed adolph bursting from the feeble grasp of his servant and rushing up the steps of the altar it was indeed adelaide that he held in his eager embrace the warm and living adelaide who had been buried for dead in her long trance and had only escaped from the grave by the sacrilegious daring of the sexton of cologne End of section five section six of the rover volume one number eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the rover volume one number eight edited by seba smith and lawrence labrie section six i know thou hast gone by t k curvy i know thou hast gone to the home of thy rest then why should my soul be so sad i know thou hast gone where the weary are blessed and the mourner looks up and is glad where love has put off in the land of its birth the stains it had gathered in this and hope the sweet singer that gladdened the earth lies asleep on the bosom of bliss i know thou hast gone where thy forehead is starred with the beauty that dwelt in thy soul where the light of thy loveliness cannot be marred nor thy heart be flung back from its goal i know thou hast drank of the lethe that flows through a land where they do not forget that sheds over memory only repose and takes from it only regret in thy far-away dwelling wherever it be i believe thou hast visions of mine and the love that made all things a music to me i yet have not learnt to resign in the hush of the night in the waste of the sea or alone with the breeze on the hill i have ever a presence that whispers of thee and my spirit lies down and is still mine eye must be dark that so long has been dimmed ere again it may gaze upon thine but my heart has revealings of thee and thy home in many a token and sign i never look up with a vow to the sky but a light like thy beauty is there and i hear a low murmur like thine in reply when i pour out my spirit in prayer and though like a mourner that sits by a tomb i am wrapped in a mantle of care yet the grief of my bosom oh call it not gloom is not the black grief of despair by sorrow revealed as the stars are by night far off a bright vision appears and hope like the rainbow a creature of light is born like the rainbow from tears end of section six recording by alan mapstone section seven of the rover volume one number eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the rover volume one number eight edited by seba smith and lawrence labrie section seven to be good is to be happy by rao to be good is to be happy angels are happier than men because they are better guilt is the source of sorrow tis the fiend the avenging fiend that follows us behind 
with whips and stings the blessed know none of this but rest in everlasting peace of mind and find the height of all their heaven in goodness end of section seven section eight of the rover volume one number eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sonia the rover volume one number eight edited by seba smith and lawrence labrie section eight the last man by t campbell all worldly shapes shall melt in gloom the sun himself must die before this mortal shall assume its immortality i saw a vision in my sleep that gave my spirit strength to sweep adown the gulf of time i saw the last of human mould that shall creation's death behold as adam saw her prime the sun's eye had a sickly glare the earth with age was wan the skeletons of nations were around that lonely man some had expired in fight the brands still rested in their bony hands in plague and famine some earth's cities had no sound nor tread and ships were drifting with their dead to shores where all was dumb yet prophet-like that lone one stood with dauntless words and high that shook the sear leaves from the wood as if a storm passed by saying we are twins in death proud son thy face is cold thy race is run tis mercy bids thee go for thou ten thousand thousand years hast seen the tide of human tears that shall no longer flow what though beneath thee man put forth his pomp his pride his skill and arts that made fire flood and earth the vessels of his will yet mourn i not thy parted sway thou dim discrowned king of day for all those trophied arts and triumphs that beneath thee sprang healed not a passion or a pang entailed on human hearts go let oblivion's curtain fall upon the stage of men nor with thy rising beams recall life's tragedy again its piteous pageants bring not back nor waken flash upon the wreck of pain anew to writhe stretched in diseases shapes abhorred or moan in battle by the sword like grass beneath the scythe even i am weary in yon skies to watch thy fading fire test of all sumless agonies behold not me expire my lips that speak thy dirge of death their rounded gasp and gurgling breath to see thou shalt not boast the eclipse of nature spreads my pall the majesty of darkness shall receive my parting ghost this spirit shall return to him that gave its heavenly spark yet think not sun it shall be dim when thou thyself art dark no it shall live again and shine in bliss unknown to beams of thine by him recalled to breath who captive led captivity who robbed the grave of victory and took the sting from death go son while mercy holds me up on nature's awful waste to drink this last and bitter cup of grief that man shall taste go tell the night that hides thy face thou sawest the last of adam's race on earth's sepulchral clod the darkening universe defy to quench his immortality or shake his trust in god end of section eight end of the rover volume one number eight edited by seba smith and lawrence labrie